Rolf Meyer is one of the best known faces in South Africa and from the history of this country and during our transition to democracy, he was one of the people who led negotiations on behalf of the National Party with the ANC's chief mediator, who happens to now be our president, Cyril Ramaphosa. And whatever your political standing, you can't help but be in awe of what was achieved in those special days. It's now been more than 20 years since he left active politics, but that doesn't mean that he hasn't been busy and he hasn't been making a difference in many other ways. On his groundbreaking work and some of the tough decisions that he's had to make and his comments on politics today, I'm very, very happy to have in the studio. Rolf Mayer, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. I mean, it's 20 years, you know, even longer, 25 years, if you think about the beginning of negotiations, and you were there in all of that. There are very few people who are around today who can, first of all, say that they were such an integral part of it. You were the youngest minister in the cabinet there by a long way. <laughs> um, I mean, most of your colleagues are not around anymore. Yeah. And those who are probably don't know where they are <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but you were young and you were able to see things, I think, quite a lot differently to the way that they all saw things. I mean, when, you, when you're asked to recall these, these memories of those days, is it easy for you? Is it something that was you realized you were part of history and you, you took time to actually kind of commit to memory some of the things that were going on? Let me, let me start off with the point that you made about how young we were. Yeah. <clears throat> because I think it's, it's relevant to, to, to remind youngsters of today of their responsibility. Uh, I mean, when we were in the thick of th things, negotiating the future of the, of the country, so to speak, uh, Cyril was not even 40, and I was just over 40. And, and you know, it, it was a hell of a task, but I don't think we realized how important it was uh, or how much it was probably beyond our reach. <laughs> you didn't uh, realize? I don't think so. I, I, we just got in there and, and did it. You know, I was, like you said, part of it right from the beginning when the when the talks started. And we went through the typical process of talks about talks, breakdowns, then yeah. negotiations, breakdowns. And, you know, so it's the typical cycle that, that we went through that you would find in textbooks. Um, but, but I was there right from the beginning when we started to talk about talks. Um, and... and, and you know, about a year or two later, uh, it so happened that Cyril and I got together as the respective uh, leaders of the teams. Uh, he was Secretary General of the ANC by then. I was appointed Minister of Constitutional Affairs because my predecessor went ill. And, and that is how it came about, that we, that we fell into this <laughs> situation where we couldn't get out of. Uh, unless we found an answer. Uh, and I, I can recall, you know, so many times where we were just uh, facing each other, not knowing where we were going in terms <laughs> of finding the solutions. It's terrifying but, to think now. But, but there was one very clear picture in front of me, and that was we had to go through it. Yeah. Nothing else. There was no turning back. There was no turning back. And, and, if, you and if you couldn't work it out between the two of you, then we were doomed as a country. Well, you know, that is probably an exaggeration. Uh, I don't the, know. I the, mean, the, the final yeah. responsibility lied with, with Mandela and de Klerk. Yeah. They were our principals. Right. So you were doing the groundwork for them. We were doing the groundwork. We were busy with it on a daily basis. And nothing but you else. also, you were looking at the detail that perhaps would have passed them by in many of these, you know, more, more nuanced conversations. I think it's important to recognize the fact that we had teams on both sides that yeah. dealt with the detail. Not even Cyril and I were always on top of the detail. But there were teams that did. Um, and, and, you know, once we had an overall picture of where we were going, which emerged after the Boi Patong incident in yes, 1992, um, once we had clarity about the fact that we're moving together into the future, we could then ask the teams on both sides to, to look at the detail and put the, 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 the content of the first the interim constitution and later on the final constitution uh, step by step into place. And, so, and we fortunately had some of the best brains in the country that, that worked on that. Uh, legal brains, people with constitutional minds. 
you know, um, well, I often hear people are saying, oh, uh, Cyril and I were the authors of the Constitution, and that's nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't were, us. There were many. There were many. But look, I have to start off with an apology because I've launched straight into this. It's sure. been something I've wanted to talk to you about for all of my adult life. I remember when I was in high school and watching all of this unfold, and I was already, I was someone who was interested in history. So I was perhaps more aware than the, the average person at school. And I was reading newspapers and I was aware of the, the different people involved from all the sides. And, but even I find myself um, completely dumbstruck when I go to places like the Apartheid Museum and I, and I see all of it. And I, my, my own recollection is very different. You, you almost have to do a refresher course every now and then just to see mm. how very much water has gone under the bridge. The reason I want to apologize is I didn't, we didn't even sort of spend five minutes just catching up <laughs> you yeah. know finding out what you're up to um yeah. and we'll we'll do that i promise it's just it's interesting to me that that the characters who were important then continue to be important now and and both you and and the president have maintained a relationship you said last time i spoke to you you actually communicate fairly regularly even now yeah you know, we are getting together from time to time, but on a specific aspect of what I'm doing at the moment. I right. mean, he's busy with the country. He's yes. busy with the broad business of government. Uh, and I am just assisting in a small bit on a specific project that we're working on, which became known as the Public-Private Growth Initiative. Right. And in that context, I see him from time to time, like, like last week at the investment conference. Mm. Uh, and so I see him from time to time in, in, in when there's, let's say, an official part to it. But, you know, the nice thing is every time we see each other, I, it's like a continuation of the old friendship. But it must have been difficult in the beginning. Um, and I'm trying to cast my mind back now to when you first entered politics. And I mean, that was a very different national party. It was a very different South Africa and I just want to spend a few minutes hearing your memories of what that time was like, what the, the principles at that time were, who the main characters in the story were at that stage, because you were in it. Yeah. Well, you know, I went into politics in 1979. <laughs> That's ages <laughs> ago. And, and I was fairly young at that stage, of course. Um, but it was exciting for me to to get elected to become a member of parliament. Mm. Wherever in the world you are, that yeah. remains something special, if you are just 30 or 31 years old, as I was, then, then it's special. But two things that will never leave my mind. <clears throat> Once I was elected, sworn in, and I took the seat in parliament, in the old assembly building in, in, in the Houses of Parliament in Cape Town, Two things struck me. The one was happiness. I'm here. Uh, you know, I've arrived, sort of. The second one is, it's unreal. I'm not representing the nation. I'm re representing 13% of the, of the people as it was at that stage. And 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 that thought that's you know, in, was was that thought was ingrained in my mind, f ever after. Uh, it it burned in my mind. It mm. was it was there. It, it kept my mind focused in terms of the need for change because it, this was unacceptable. But there were many people in the, the National Party of that day who didn't think that change was necessary, including the then Prime Minister, President, um, because obviously it was a different time. And people look back and they think they can apply the ideas and the norms and the mores of today on previous era. It wasn't like that for many people in the National Party at that stage. And I mean, I'm curious about how you recall Pervia Buerta mm. and what your first interactions with him were like. Well, let me just take one step back as far as my own memory is concerned. All of us, my generation in particular, um, were ingrained in apartheid. Mm. And... and, and I often said my generation in particular was probably the first real beneficiaries of apartheid. And I can look at the facts, how my upbringing uh, was, made was, 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 was made advantageous 
from the benefits of apartheid, apartheid laws that were brought on the on the law book in the 1950s and 1960s, mm. and and so we were ingrained in apartheid, and it took a bit of exercise. It it was a challenge to get out of that grip. Yeah, and 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 my own experience was when I was a young lawyer in the mid 1970s. Uh, I became confronted in my own mind about what is in the law book, specifically with regard to the position of so-called urban blacks. Because remember, according to apartheid, blacks had to exercise their political rights in the homelands. Right. And then there was this gap, urban blacks, what to do with them. And my first, my first confrontation in my own mind was when I started to realize, but this is totally unjust. We can't go on like this. In any case, so now I started to work in my own mind. The process of transformation sort of started. But despite that, I allowed myself to be elected to, as a member of parliament for the National Party. Well, sometimes you have to start the change from inside. Yeah, but, you know, I, I must also admit that it was... Um, it was the only thing sort of to do if you wanted to really make progress in politics. And Absolutely. I think I was born into politics, quite frankly. I, it was not something that that <laughs> happened suddenly or overnight. It was it was there from even my school days. Um, that that desire to become involved uh, in, in, in a political environment of some kind. You asked the question about my first uh, experience with, with PW. When I went to Parliament, he was, of course, the leader of the National Party. He was the Prime Minister at that stage, later on became the President. Um, you know, I think in a certain way, in the early stages, I had a sort of a love-hate re relationship there. Uh, he was, in a certain way, good for me. Uh, somehow he might have liked me. <laughs> But at the same time, he was this brutal guy who, who had no uh, had no understanding but of, there must of where have, the country had to go to. There must have been some quality in the man for him to have risen to the height that he did. And there must have been some charisma or charm as well. I mean, all I can recall, having again been a small child, was that occasionally this guy would appear on TV and wag his finger at us yeah. and tell us that we had to do what he wanted us to do. Yeah. But he must have been inspiring to some people. He must have had some real value and quality. And history has a way of making everything binary, that someone is a bad person or a good person. What I'm curious about is what those qualities might have been. He started off his political career as a party organizer. In other words, right there from the grassroots level. And I think he stayed an organizer for his life. He had no other qualifications. He had no other uh, interest. He had no other career. So he started from very young in that capacity, and and he stayed on and became, in the end, organizer of the country, mm -hmm. um, so to speak. Um, and 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 that is probably the characteristic, if one has to find one, that that summarizes him best. So he was a good organizer. Um, the way in which he tried to address the challenges at the time was from that perspective. Okay. Uh, and so, so when he first appointed me to government, it was in the position of deputy minister of <laughs> police, <laughs> of all things. Uh, and I think back at it many times. Was that under Adrian Flock then? Yeah. Who was the minister? Exactly. This was 86, 1986. Oh. And my specific responsibility was to run the state of emergency. There was a national state of emergency at that time. And, and PW's instruction was go out there, find out what the reasons for the unrest is, and use the apparatus of the state to address the needs of the people. <laughs> that was his instruction. In other words, not to go out and and, and torture torture people but rather to find out what the problems are and and settle it so mm. if the problem was for instance the unavailability of school books i could use the the <laughs> the, the powers that i had to ensure that school books be delivered at the fastest possible rate if the problem was water supply or 
electricity or whatever in a particular township. So it meant that I had to travel around the country and visit all of the places where the unrest occurred. Now, the reason why I'm saying today it was probably one of the best experiences I had is it exposed me to what was real life for people in the townships. Which most white people at that stage didn't exactly. even know. Exactly. And today still. Yeah. Today no, that's still. absolutely right. Yeah. So, so I had the benefit through that, if it was a benefit. But I had the opportunity. But also, then, it, it's, a, it's a horrible job to have to deal with. I had um, the opportunity to visit practically all townships around the country and all provinces as, and, as it existed. And try there. to solve their problems. But it was almost a poison chalice because yeah. there was only so much you could do. Yeah. The problems, the real cause of the unrest was something much, much deeper than exactly. practical matters. But it's that insight that also developed in yeah. my own mind and my own understanding of why, where we were. So in other words, that it was not about school books. It was not about water supply or electricity or what. It was about politics. Yeah. And, and did you think that PW gave you this assignment because he genuinely wanted to solve the problem and just practically deal with it? Or because he knew that it was insurmountable and, and was just trying to assuage some of the the obvious areas of pain. No, I think he had the conviction that it can be solved. Really? He, he thought he's on the right track. Yeah. We must just solve this, th these problems on the ground. And, and, and this is where I, I think, you know, he, he appointed me because I think he liked me. Mm -hmm. And I had direct interaction with him. So whenever I came back from a township, I could go straight to him and say, this is what I've experienced. And, and I was sometimes very frank and very direct with him in terms of those experiences. So you'd walk into his office in the union buildings and yeah. you'd tell him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for some people, that's just, you know, you, you lived this. And I know for you, it's the only life you know, you know. This is your history. But it's very, very hard for the rest of us to get our heads around it. Yeah, it, 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 it was, and, and you know, and th those are the times that, you know, the country suffered most. Did he say, did he say to you, hello, Rolf, what can you tell me, you know? Yeah. Just like that? Yeah. yeah. Were you exactly like that. aware of the fact, because a lot of people weren't, that he was going to make that Rubicon speech when he made it? Yeah. Because that seems to have caught a lot of people off guard. Yeah. And there's a part of the history that's a bit, gray in terms of how exactly things went down because yeah. a lot of the people in the party were moving towards a future that they saw was sustainable and, and, and workable for South Africa and other people wanted to stay where they were and he kind of made that call right? Yeah well you know to bring it in context uh, today if I have to look back and say what are the mistakes that have been made in that period I would say that that was one of the most outstanding mistakes. Mm. August of 1985, when he was supposed to make that speech, in other words, to announce the release of Mandela and the start of a process of change, he didn't do so. It, there was high expectations, even from within. Mm. I can recall myself watching at this speech that he, were, he was making at, 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 um, in the Durban City Hall. And, um, and, and all of us, we were made to believe that here is going to be the announcement. And then it didn't happen. And what followed from there, 1985 to 1990, was probably the most terrible years of apartheid. If you look at all the... Uh, Did he just decide on his own? You know, that is... Because you were a cabinet. That's, that's something that's never been answered. And the people, like you said earlier, that probably had the answers uh, are, not any, are not around anymore. Yeah. Um, Allegedly, he he was prepared to make some an announcement in regard to the release of Mandela, and then it was leaked out, uh, and he uh. and he got irritated. It was leaked allegedly by one or two of his colleagues, oh, really? and he got so irritated that he scrapped that that speech, and uh, and didn't say anything of of substance. Wow, you know. Whether it's all true, I don't know. I was too jun junior at that stage, mm -hmm. not close enough to the fire to know exactly. But the reality is that was a wasted opportunity. Mm. If you just think about it. We could have taken the whole thing back another four or five years. Well, in, in 1985, 
you know, uh, the, there was, and and I hesitate to say this, but there was probably more of a of a level playing field in terms of where we found ourselves then compared to five years later. In 1990, when we started the process of negotiations, we had our backs against the wall. Yeah. We had very few um, leverages that we could utilize. And then when it changed and and de Klerk was the leader, um, again, that was mostly because, as I understood it, PW's health was in decline. But it was also he was kind of pushed out. Yeah, he had a health was the main reason. He would not have probably stepped down uh, <clears throat> if he didn't have a stroke uh, at the beginning of at the beginning of nineteen eighty nine. Right. It was January of eighty nine, and then he he had a stroke, and he decided to first step down as as leader of the national party. He stayed on as president of the country. But FW was then elected and took over as leader of the party. And and from from there on, this was around about February when this happened, when FW was elected. And then from there on for the next six months or so, it was a battle between the two of them. Really? Because PW could did, not accept somebody else to take the party. And did, so, did people square up on either side? Yeah, indeed. And what was your position then? What was your thinking? Well, my position was clear. We had to make the change. FW, oh, sorry, PW had to go. Hmm. Uh, but it was two centers of power, and they were contesting all the time. Almost like the factionalism you see in the ANC now. <laughs> exactly. The Zuma era right. reminded me very strongly of that. Yeah. And then under FW de Klerk, who also, you know, history has a way, again, of, of making everything seem like it's easy to, to understand. Like, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. I mean, he also had an enormous challenge in trying to, first of all, bring in, we remember the referendum in those days, what a big deal that was. Mm. Um, but before that, the unbanning of the ANC, the release of Nelson Mandela, how, how involved were you in all of that part of the process? Well, you know, if W, the moment he was elected uh, as leader of the, of the party first, I think he started to prepare himself for what was going to happen, knowing that at some point, sooner or later, he would become the president of the country. And like I said, six months later, it happened. And then maybe this was a good thing that he had that six months of preparation. Yeah. Uh, and and when once he was elected as president of the country and sworn in in September of 1989, he could immediately start to make his moves. Um, now, I was fortunate to be part of of this planning exercise right from the beginning. There was a, a F, FW immediately appointed a committee that became known as the Ministerial Committee on Negotiations. Right. And I was part of that. In fact, I was the secretary of this committee in the beginning. And, and you know, the, the whole process of the decisions about um, the release of Mandela and the unbanning and so on and so on uh, started to emerge in that process. Um, and and you might recall there were certain steps that were taken already within the question of weeks after mm. FW was sworn in. That's like, right. for instance, the release of Walter Sassoulo, Govan and Becky and others. Uh, that was September of 1980. Were those decisions easy to make? Because you were in the room while they were being made. I think it was it was sort of inevitable. Um, you know, the, the the vast majority of white people, including therefore the National Party, yeah, realized that change had to come. Right, and and the 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 common um, thesis, at least at that stage within the National Party, was that we had to start the process of negotiations. And knowing that there was only one way to get it going, and that was Mandela had to be part of it. So he had to be released, and the ANC had to participate in the negotiations. Uh, so, so the majority within the National Party ranks 
were convinced of, of that route, that trajectory at that stage. Uh, by the way, the only, the only consideration that left <laughs> a little bit of debate within National Party circles at the time was whether the SACP should also be unbanned. Hmm. Um, because there was this, this, uh, this, this thinking line of thinking within white Afrikaner uh, circles, and therefore also in the National Party, that the the biggest problem of everything was the, the Communist. Communist Party, and the link with the Soviet Union. Well, it's, it wasn't in those days. It wasn't an unreasonable assumption to make because we'd seen their influence in, in the common turn all over the world, right? And we'd seen it cause war and conflict and in some cases just a mania that, w that was obviously a preoccupation of the old Nationalist Party. It, it was indeed, and it was, you know, the, the, the impact of the Soviet influence all over the African continent was very visible. Yeah. But... but were, there, were there guys who were the most outspoken about that. I'm thinking of people like Magnus Malan and, yeah. you know, yeah, those were the guys, huh? And some of the church leaders. Yes. The, the Roy Gefar. And w did they consider you to be some kind of traitor in some respect? Because your opinion was different. Uh, yeah. The, the, did you have to deal with the, people talking behind your back as you left the, the meetings? Uh, indeed. But the traitor mantle, uh, you know, became more relevant as the time went on, as the negotiations progressed. Ah. But let me just c conclude this point about the Communist <laughs> Party. Um, I, I will never forget this because it was it, it was very close to me, the discussions that took place. Now, remember, this was at the same time that the Soviet Union was collapsing. And then came the fall of the Berlin Wall in November of 1989, which was now 30 years ago. And, and I think it was all contributing towards making it easier to come to the right decisions. And... Uh, but still, there was there was ob there were objections within the national party that can we really do this? Let the communist party also go. And 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 then um, a very senior uh, journalist, uh, an editor, in fact, and I had the discussion just vaguely on the sidelines about what would be the implication if the communist party would not be. Unbanned, and he made the very valid point, of course, and said, "Well, if they are not unbanned, the ANC will not accept their freedom, mm -hmm. their liberation, because they are tied right. as part of the alliance." So it was an either-or. It was an either-or. Um, did you, at this point, realize that that there was a, a direction that was no that that it was already an, at a no turning back point, or was was it further on? Because at this stage, you hadn't yet started to negotiate. You didn't know what you were dealing with. And just as the ANC had no idea whether they were being tricked or not, you guys had no idea of whether you were dealing with reasonable people here who had an expectation of delivering democracy in, 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 a, in a form that we kind of understood it after 1992-94. You were really guessing. You were, you were going into uncharted territory. Absolutely. Absolutely, you're totally right. But but we had this advantage. Uh, I, I think looking back at it, it can be called a, a, an advantage. Mm -hmm. And that is that the moment Mandela walked out of prison, the whole process was irreversible. Yeah. And, and I've, in my observations about other conflict situations that I visited, and there are plenty of them in the last 20 years or more, um, the, the the what I what I found is that if there is not a point of irreversibility, people tend to go back to their original positions very easily and frequently. Whilst in our case, the moment Mandela was released, it was irreversible. Nobody could put him back in jail. Yeah. That is just the reality. So we had to go forward and find the answers, uh, but but the answers were not clear. And, and quite frankly, we were not always certain about where we are going. 
and, and, and the first phases of the real negotiations, I'm talking when, when we started to put Kudesa together, as it was originally, um, the, you know, we were, we were starting to aim for things that could not work. Uh, and we had to scrap those ideas. Uh, initially, the National Party, <laughs> and in its own formulations of proposals, uh, the, the, the thinking was very much based on group and minority rights and the protection of that. Um, and of course, that was not, not where the answer could, could be found. Uh, and, and, and it was only after the collapse of negotiations, after the Boi Patong massacre, yes. that we had to go back to the drawing board and establish for ourselves what is it that we really want from the future. Now, I'm sorry I keep harping on about the characters involved here, but I think for a lot of historians, those are the things that are often left out. I mean, much of what was written down and much of what was discussed and, and, and the process is now part of of understood and written history. But the the curious thing for me is the first time that you sat down with Mandela after he'd been in prison and how that discussion went and what kind of an idea you had of the man at the very beginning and how that might have changed. He was released on the 11th of February 1990. I only met him for the first time in, in May of that year. Wow. Uh, despite the fact that I was part of the negotiating team and all that. Wow. Um, but uh, uh, the context was he, he came out of prison and then he traveled the country. Right. And after that, he traveled the world. <laughs> You know, and and we only got to sit down to b with business by May of that year. A lot of preparatory work took place, of course, to make that happen. And remember, it was not only Mandela and and those who were in prison that had to be released, but also the exiles had to be returned. That's right, including Thabo Mbeki and many others. So all of that took took uh, quite a bit of time, and so when we first got together it was at the Grote Skier <laughs> minute meeting in, in there's a in photograph May. of that meeting yeah there's a very famous photograph yeah. of you guys there's I think Joe Slovo's in yes. it Nelson Mandela's obviously in it F.W. Yeah. Leclerc um, you're very prominent in the picture Cyril Jacob yeah. Zuma's in the picture no Cyril was not there wasn't he not at that not at that moment oh because he was not part of the ANC negotiating team at that stage oh right he, he was prominent on the day that Mandela walked out of prison. Okay. Out of Victor Fester. Cyril was one of the organizing committee. He, he drove the car, didn't he? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> but he, he was part of the organizing committee for the release. But, um, but Grote Skiri was not there because he was not yet then part of the negotiating team. How did that meeting go? Okay, so your How question did it was, start? what was my experience? <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, I'm the, sorry, I'm jumping around because of, there's no, so much I want to know. No, the, 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 this was fascinating. I think, you know, like other things that were, became burnt into one's mind, that one was definitely there. You know, we we, we arrived there at, at the Grote Skier um, house premises and, um, you know, the team started to line up and eventually after coffee and what <laughs> and and this is a fascinating moment if you think about it you know it's the first time that we ever saw each other in person yeah we and knew from their each side these enemies these people who've kept we, us oppressed we, we knew each other you know? quite well from uh, from intelligence <laughs> sources <laughs> <laughs> but, I will never forget but when, never met when i saw joe medici for the first time i shook his hand i said i know exactly who you are that type of thing you know <laughs> But <clears throat> so we, we, we sat down and we were positioned across the table from each other, from the leadership down. Yes. And, you know, it, there was this unbelievable moment, uh, you know, uh, uh, introducing, in, introducing the teams, but at the same time knowing each other <laughs> from, <laughs> from descriptions that we read in <laughs> intelligence reports and what. And it was a fascinating experience. And yet there was Mandela in my experience the first time. You know, wow. And, and, uh, 
and of course he made a he made a, an impression right from the start. Mm. Um, what kind of an impression? As he's he's the leader. Yeah. He's the leader. He's the man in control. It was like Sia Kulisi the other day when they they tossed the coin. Uh, him and Farrell. Uh, uh, I I saw that that picture there, where they were tossing the coin and the, and the ref <laughs> was standing between them, and it was quite clear Sia was in control of that moment. Yeah. Farrell looked like a bewildered man. <laughs> right. Instead of the captain of his team. Now, Mandela was like that. He was in, in charge. It was quite clear right from the beginning. Um, he knew exactly where we were and where we want, he wanted us to go to. Um, but, but the rest of that day was fascinating because now we're starting to make opening statements and each party saying what they want to achieve from this event and so on and so on. But I think the, f the thing that we couldn't wait for was to get socially together, you know, oh. have dinner together that evening and, and sitting together on a mixed basis at the different tables. That must have been incredible. And, and that Who did you end up next to? Incidentally, Joe Modise. <laughs> you know, and the roof party was there and, and one or two others. And here we were sitting and and it was like was it congenial was it friendly absolutely was it? Huh. it was like you and i now talking we couldn't stop exchanging you know asking questions so you know where are you coming from and and what is it, what are your roots that type of thing you know it was absolutely fascinating the the whole impression that that i came away with from from that occasion was that we belong together hmm. we belong together there was nothing that sort of determined it differently. Which is interesting because you'd come out of this complete um, adversarial relationship. Certainly from their point of view, there was huge skepticism. Um, even from, from people within your party, there was a lot of fear and trepidation. Despite the fact that at that stage the machinery of state was still very much in your hands, you know, in, in your party's hands, uh, was there resistance at all at that stage, or did it only creep in later? I think there was resistance from small elements within the National Party. People kept on asking questions, yeah. but the main resistance, of course, came from the Conservatives, the Conservative yeah. Party, right. and later on Ter Blanche and. And his crowd. Treernicht, hey. Treernicht. Andries Treernicht. He was the leader of the Conservative Party. Right. Um, you know, and and I keep on saying that when FW called for the referendum in 1992 to get uh, an answer to the question, are we on the right track with the changes that are taking place? Um, and that, that was a decision by FW. To, to call for that referendum. And I think that was one of his biggest successes because the campaign, the campaign once he called the referendum, the campaign that followed was primarily his mm. to convince the white community that we have to, to go ahead with the changes. But the 30% that voted against yeah. you know, was indicative of how strong people felt yeah. against the change. In other words, they wanted to retain apartheid. And and if you ask me today, I think that the remnants of that thirty percent are still around. Yeah, well, you can't find them. You try and find someone who voted no in the referendum. They like hen's yeah, teeth. Yeah, except if you go <laughs> to the rural areas. You think? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I come across them. It's still the the kind of people that think I'm a traitor. Right. And do resist me as as, as a result of that. You will you will be surprised. The other day, I came across some of them in Stellenbosch. As recently as a month ago. Wow. What do they say to you? No, they, they won't say it to, to me directly. They say it on s social media. Oh, really? Yeah. That I'm the one that was the, the, the seller out. Oh, right. That type of thing. So how do you feel when you read now in, in newspapers and you see these opinion pieces by people who really don't have an appreciation for history at all and you hear them saying that Mandela and de Klerk were sellouts? I mean, you can't have both sides of, 
of this situation being sellouts. Yeah. It was a negotiated settlement. You hear a lot of people on the left saying yeah. the struggle was victorious and it was an all-out win, which obviously it wasn't. And you hear people on the right saying that you guys were yeah. farayers yeah. and you were sellouts. Yeah. Neither are correct. Correct. I mean, they, they just don't have any yeah. understanding of the nuances of what took place. Yeah. How, yeah. how close did we come to failing? And, and at what point were you worried? There were, there were quite a few stages where there were big challenges, challenges to the process. Uh, I, I think it, it's important to remember that what we, what we established well uh, in the process of preparing for the, for the negotiations and so on was that we accepted that it has to be a process. Mm -hmm. It's not a one-off. It's not one day uh, a solution. It's one day at a time, but <laughs> but there's a bigger picture, and that picture was encompassed in a, in a process. So that is probably what saved us on more than one occasion, because the process was threatened several times. And two that stand out in my mind was Boipeton and the calling off of all negotiations also at the bilateral level between the ANC and the National Party government by Mandela. He called it off. Yeah. And, and you know, my, my, uh, my heart <laughs> sank in my, into my shoes when that, when that moment arrived, when that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, then followed the process where Cyril and I got together and we we could repair the situation over a period of time and the, and the process could resume, which it did. Where, did. where did you and Cyril meet to have your serious conversations? Was it in different places? Do you remember any specific places where you had big breakthroughs, where the two of you had time to work out some of the more complex issues? The... The, the breakdown, this particular breakdown and the period that followed was probably, in my mind, the, the, the most important part of finding the settlement. Mm -hmm. so, so what happened was Mandela called off the negotiations and the next moment Cyril phoned me and said, when can we talk? <laughs> uh, probably knowing that I would not run to the media and say, you know, the, all what Mandela said was nonsense. Uh, but because we had to take it serious, knowing what was behind it. Uh, but, but then Cyril and I came together uh, for the next period of time with our small teams on both sides. And, and well, after three months, I think we could say that the settlement was made that saved the country in the long term. Did you meet in government buildings? Did you meet on farms where did you go um we we started off now this was a bad moment yeah talks were scrapped right completely brought to a stand i mean this is pre cadessa and all of that stuff right this, this was during cadessa during okay so everything came to a standstill mm -hmm. cadessa collapsed right people went home uh, but then we we got together and, and I will never forget this, in the first few days and first few weeks, we were really at each other. It was, it was bad, a bad time for us because we suddenly, the, the, the level of trust that emerged was suddenly under threat. Yeah. Uh, and there were big challenges and we were hostile right. in, in, those, in that situation. But then out of that, out of this hostility came the, the understanding and the realization that we have to find a way forward. Um, and, and this was probably, that, that, that is why I'm saying, I think the period that followed the breakdown of Kudesa, the breakdown of the bilateral talks, was probably the best moment that we could have reached in a certain way. And that is... It forced us to go back to the drawing board. It forced us. Yeah. Because suddenly we had to ask ourselves, what is it that we want from the future instead of what is it that we want to protect from the past? 
And that brought a change. So where the thinking was up to that moment on the National Party side, we want to protect individual, uh, sorry, group rights and minority protection, the shift was made towards the protection of individual rights yes, on an equal basis for all. Now, philosophically, this is interesting because I think we're, we're at a stage now in, in human understanding and in, in, in the evolution of democracy where people are again starting to appreciate those enlightenment values and where the expression of individual rights is again being asserted in the face of the expression of group rights, which has a lot of dangerous results, connotations, associations. Um, where did you draw from? Because you, you guys couldn't have been, first of all, you couldn't have been alone in this. You said that there were teams. But the, the volume of material available to people who are discussing important matters like this, and here you are crafting, among other things, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa going forward. What is going to matter in the courts, in the executive, in the legislature? This stuff is not small. Do you read, um, you know, uh, the, the the works of Voltaire and and um, and Thomas Paine? And are we looking at the American founding fathers at this point? Are we looking at the works of Marx. What what are we using as the inspirational? Because those people spent their entire lives deliberating on these things that you had to now squeeze their experience and your collective experience into something which would eventually become a document. How do you decide what's important? I I think first of all it was not ideological. And 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 thankfully we can say it today. Because if the ANC had to resort to their ideological position and the National Party the same, we probably would never have found each other. So so what happened in <laughs> practical sense is that we, when the breakdown came, we had to go and back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, what is it that we really want from a future constitution for the country? And you know what emerged? A joint document that became known as the Record of Understanding. And it's it's a two and a half page document. You can read it up. It's it's there on Google. Yeah. It's a two and a half page document, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, much of it is just crap. It's not relevant. <laughs> it's not. It's not. I'm sure you didn't think that at the time. No, no. It, surely not, because it was about serious things, <laughs> yes, like dangerous weapons, and, yes, yes, yes. and protests and hostels and things like yeah. that. But. The, the real element of significance was the first page that defined what is it that will bind us together for the future. The essence of a future constitutional framework in which Im it will embody a Bill of Rights and the protection of those rights by means of a constitutional process and a constitutional court. And there was a common understanding about this? Absolutely. It wasn't a matter of discussion and debate and, it was a, and consternation. It was absolute understanding to the extent that Mandela and the clerks signed that document as an wow. agreement between them. I mean, I think for a lot of people that's quite a big deal. For sure. Because now we, we again tend to see things as being very binary, that it was the side pro, that side against. That, that is why I'm saying that document, the record of understanding was... Uh, in essence, the settlement in South Africa. Right. Because from we, we found common ground on that. And once that was in place, we could say, okay, now we can move to the, to the details. And in the months that followed, we started to put together step by step the different elements of the interim constitution first, which was then completed at the end of the following year. This, what I'm talking about, the, the the record of understanding was signed on the 26th of September 1992. Mm. And the interim constitution was completed by the end of 1993. And once that was in place, you know... It was much easier. Much easier. Then we could start to look at the final constitution, which was a more technical exercise, or technocratic exercise. Yeah. Then we started to look at what works in other constitutional democracies. And you relied... Uh, among others on the Canadians quite heavily at that point. 
Well, I would or is that something that's been out. blown out of proportion? I think it's a little bit out of proportion. Okay. We did take a lot of, of, of their advice on board, in, including very specifically the, the, the notion of cooperative governance, right. which we have embodied in our constitutional framework. But similarly, we learned a lot from the, from the Germans. All oh, right. And from the Indians <laughs> and the Australians and the Americans and even the the British, despite the fact that they don't have a constitution, yeah, but they have a working democracy. Yes. So, so all of those we could embody into our final constitution. So, so back to your question, I don't think we relied on <laughs> some specific scholars, historical or recent. Politi- political ideologists and, and, and philosophers would be disappointed by that, but it's, it, I find it actually quite reassuring that pragmatism wins out. I think so. Yeah. I think so. And, and con- good constitutional minds that we had within South Africa. And you, yeah, and you, you trusted each other at that point. Did it ever get to a stage where you thought you'd made mistakes? But big mistakes, like we've got a, we've got a major problem on our hands here. Or by that stage had... I, had I think we, you know, we, the whole process, if you think about it, was six years from the release of Mandela till he signed the final constitution. Six years. So we had plenty of time to iron out not only the differences but also possible mistakes. And therefore, I think we can say today that we have a damn good constitution. Yeah, no, we do. And, and, and everybody in the world recognizes that. Um, do, do you feel that there is an appreciation for the Constitution? And you're allowed to not be magnanimous here, if you don't mind my saying, because it seems to be in your nature to be to, to underplay and to downplay your role and, and even that of, of President Ramaphosa. But it, it's, a, it's a sad thing to see some people who have very little appreciation for what a constitutional democracy is, what an enormously... M- marked achievement that was at the time in a South Africa that was very divided and very complex. And that because they think they could somehow have done a better job, that there are people today who criticize that. Do you find a general appreciation for it? Or is it, or is there just an ignorance of history and an ignorance of the achievement itself? People that took interest in terms of where we were and what we achieved during the negotiations uh, have a lot of appreciation. I come across that on a regular basis. But, of course, the next generation were not around when yeah. apartheid was still there. And, and, and you know, their, their understanding of what has been achieved and to what extent the Constitution was actually the, the, the pillar that saved the country uh, at that time and since uh, have a different view. So I come across youngsters who would confront me and say, you know, you made mistakes here, you made mistakes there. What? <laughs> how, how do you deal with those? How do you answer them? <laughs> well, uh, I, I remind them of the history, you know, and, and, and plead with them to go and, and understand more. Like you said earlier, go and, and visit the apartheid museum. Yeah. Um, many of them have never, <laughs> I guess. But there's also the other point that is relevant, and that is that, you know, some of the uh, some of the current experiences are blamed on the constitution incorrectly. So, hmm. but at the same time, we, I think, have to take some responsibility. How do you how do you explain that? The the reason is the following: uh, there are expectations and and hopes and and the rights embodied in the constitution that that, that are not getting fulfilled yeah uh, and we can blame it on the government very easily yeah but i think what we didn't do right if i look back now mm-hmm. and it's easy with hindsight once we completed the constitution we should have actually embarked on a process of planning how the constitution could and should have been implemented and explained and explained you know you it's easy with the benefit of hindsight to see these things but there are vast swathes of 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 south africa that never really understood what was going on they saw it as a win-lose and either or 
you know, a zero-sum game effectively. Yeah. And what the Constitution was, was none of those things. It was a negotiated settlement between two parties in a country that wanted to try and figure things out to the best of that country's eventual outcomes. Yeah. But, but, you know, to make it more even practical, the Constitution addresses all the aspirations in terms of Chapter 2, yes. the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. So it's there. But, but the Constitution doesn't prescribe how it should be implemented mm. or the aspirations should be addressed. No constitution anywhere in the world does that. You can't. So, so what we should have done, and maybe we'd, we would not have been allowed at the time, but once we finished our job, we should have actually gone back to the drawing board and say, what do we do, for instance, about education, mm -hmm. to bring about equal education in this country? Because uh, the biggest damage that the party brought over all of us was separate education. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, during the last 25 years, we did very little to correct that in terms of the outcome. Yeah, I don't think anyone will disagree with you on that. So, so that is the first thing. The, the second I, would, I keep on thinking is that we should have addressed something like, how do we construct a proper civil service that can live up to the expectations and the requirements of a nation like ours? We didn't do that. A lot of what you're saying now did spill over from 94 into 96 and you eventually resigned in 96. Did you resign because you felt that you couldn't do much more inside of government or was it as a result of the ANC saying, look, we don't need you guys anymore? Um, or were you just exhausted? <laughs> what was it? Well, the last part was probably part of it. But, you know, the reason why essentially we got out of it was the decision to leave the government of national unity. <laughs> and that was a big mistake. You think so? It was a huge mistake. Who's, it who's, never mis happened. who's mistake? Well, it was, it was FW who took the decision, but under pressure of his right-wing conservative elements in the National Party. <laughs> and that was, you know, the, the, the argument that... Do you the, and he have a chat? We had. Not only me and him, but... No, no, but do you chat now? Or is there not much of a no, relationship? No, we, today we have a fairly good relationship. Okay. But it for a while it must have been fractious. At that point especially. Yeah. In the five years that followed our departure from the government of national unity, we had no relationship. Did you feel he had capitulated? Um, I think it was rather a question of, an, if I may say so, an ideological difference of, of view of where we should have been. Hmm and how we should have taken it forward. Um, the, the, the reality is that in my own mind, I made a paradigm shift, a complete paradigm shift from where I came from as a, as a, as a, <laughs> as a youngster growing up within apartheid and the total system of apartheid yeah. to one that, that subscribed fully to democratic rights mm. in a, and an open democracy where individual rights is the, is the founding principle. And that shift that took place in my mind, I think, differentiate my position from that that FW might have taken. Did you have allies, though, who agreed with you on both sides? Yes. There were people who wanted the government of national unity to continue? Absolutely. Who were those people? Within the uh, ANC, yes, I think the vast majority of the cabinet at the time. Oh, really? Absolutely. See, it's a misun misunderstood part so, of our history. This so, I don't so think we it was well a, publicized. We had an excellent, constructive working relationship um, between the different ministers and and their line functions. Uh, to take an example, when when I saw the minister of finance now, <laughs> just two weeks ago. We had a lovely chat on, on something that he reminded me of what happened when we were together in cabinet. He was Minister of Labor at the time. time. You know, and, and, and that bond that developed there was only in the starting phase. And then before it could t take further root, the government of national unity was brought to an end. It was silly, silly. How long would you have liked it to go on for? Well, it was... 
it was prescribed yes. in the interim constitution for five years. Right. My own thinking is that we would have, in those five years, developed a basis for a coalition type of government that could have lived for a very long time thereafter. And if you compare this with similar situations elsewhere in the world, and, and you know, it, it's not it's not perfect in terms of its similarity, but no. but the Germans yes. have practiced coalition government ever since. They've never they've they've hardly ever been without it. Exactly. Yeah. And still now. And and that is the type of thing that we should have had in South Africa on a natural basis. Um, given our background and where we are coming from and yeah. what the challenges are today. And and that is what we were starting to to develop within the framework of the government of national unity. And it was never given a chance to 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 develop further. So I I personally think that is one of the biggest mistakes of the last uh, 25 years. And and do you have commentary on what happened after that from the point of view of uh, of, of appraising the ANC's dealing with the situation? Because obviously, Thabo Mbeki was far more influential even during the Mandela administration than a lot of people understood. Correct. I mean, he was the head of government for all intents and purposes, while Mandela was the head of state. Yeah. And therefore, it largely started to coalesce around him. Yeah. What was considered the way forward in the ANC. Yeah. And there was a lot of centrism that came into it. There was a lot of... Uh, what what is now almost disparagingly called neoliberalism, but the idea of of you know <clears throat> prioritizing the economy these were things that were that were on Tabo and Becky's agenda. Uh, that was probably not such a bad agenda in retrospect. Yeah, and we really hit the skids when he was ousted, perhaps for good or for bad, because you know increasingly it was becoming a government that was centered on him yeah. in a lot of ways. How do you feel about all of that? Look, I because then now you're on the outside, you can yeah, comment, you know, yeah. without having to worry about disrupting the government of national unity. It must yeah. have been an interesting time for you. No, it, it was certainly, you know, just to remind you, I, I left the National Party in '97, mm. um, and the na National Party thereafter collapsed itself. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but then I. I I helped to establish the UDM together with Bantu Olomisa, and it was, quite frankly, out of frustration mm -hmm. um, and, and, and anger. Yeah. Because I was angry with the National Party and, and Bantu was angry with the INC. Right. They kicked him out. And so uh, the, the, the two angry boys came together and, you know, we formed the UDM and it, it was a fantastic time for me because for the first time I could go into townships to canvas for votes on the back of a partner who had great acceptance. People forget that Bantu uh, in I think 96 it was had the highest number of votes in his favor on the ANC NEC list. Sure. He was number one. I don't think people was, do remember that. Yeah, he was extremely popular and within the ANC. And then he was kicked out. Yeah. So we we had a we had a, the joy of forming this new party and we did fairly well in the first election and so on. I'm I'm saying this just to say that you know there there was this period of new experience in my own political life. Um, but back to your question, uh, there was this there was this repair from apartheid. Uh, an unfolding of of new opportunities, not only under Mandela, like you said, but also under Tabo. Yeah. And if we now look at the economic trajectory, it was actually very prosperous. It was. Ongoing growth, uh, even a surplus budget at some stage under right. under Trevor. Yeah. Uh, so we had a fantastic time. Uh, you know, and. Uh, and, and 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 generally speaking, if we look at the bigger picture, it looks good, but there were still also undermining factors that yeah. started to 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 carve out some of the success. 
And unfortunately, I think Tabu made a huge mistake by by trying to get another term as ANC president. Well, that opened, in the, my door mind, for, should that opened that. up the door for Zuma and for a lot of exactly. the, the things that happened after that, right? Because exactly. he wouldn't have been able to do that yeah. if Tabo had just stepped down, and, stepped down and kind right. of found a way for... Do you think Cyril might have won that election if that had happened? Cyril or Khalema? Khalema, yeah, because, of course, at that stage, Cyril had been pushed out. Well, yeah. Cyril... You know, Cyril, uh, something people don't want to talk about either. No, but He's come but, back in, but he, he wasn't always popular in the ANC, uh, especially under Thabo and Becky. Exactly. The, there know. was never a good relationship no, there. Not at all. But but it's also, you know, uh, Cyril made a, made a choice in, in 94 yeah. uh, to leave politics. Yeah. He, he came back to, to run the Constitutional Assembly, but that was just a specific task. He never became part of the government at that stage. Mm-hmm. So his own decision was to to leave politics. And he, it was not probably, f- from a personal angle, it was probably a good decision. Yeah. Uh, hugely beneficial for him. Well, certainly in terms of business. Yeah. And now he's back and and you're no longer in the UDM. And what do you think of the UDM and, and what's happened there? And are you and Bantu still on good terms? We are in good terms. We are we are friends, I think, forever. Um, <clears throat> I left politics. I decided to resign from politics at, at the beginning of 2000, the year 2000. Um, not because I was disappointed about the UDM and, 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 and so on. It is just that I suddenly realized I've had it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to, to start developing a new career. And you, you certainly did that. You went into this business of consulting because of your negotiating skills, and you helped in places like Northern Ireland, Sri Lanka, Rwanda, Burundi, Kosovo, Bolivia, um, even in the Basque region, Middle East too. I mean, all over the world, there are going to be traces of, of what you've been able to do, some of it obviously more politically significant Another, um, are your children aware of how you've changed the world? <laughs> Do they have well, an appreciation for their father doing all of this? Um, I don't think so. Maybe they should not. <laughs> Does your wife be, appreciate because, this? Because it's not, a, you know, it, it's not necessarily always successful. We we, we had uh, a lot of attempts, you know, to to, yes. to to share the South African experience. Right. I think the most successful one that we were engaged in was Northern Ireland. Yes. Um, With Mo Molum, right? Well, yeah, 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 with her and, <coughs> but also with the different political groupings, yeah. Sinn Féin, as well as the different unionist parties. Uh, you know, we we got so close to those people on both sides that it was almost as if we were doing our own thing. At that, uh, you know, during that period, I'm talking about the period from '94 to, to 2008. Uh, so it was an extended period that we were involved there. But there were also the the f- other failures, I mean, the, the the latest failure was Bolivia, where Evo Morales, mm. you know, <laughs> uh, was sacked over the weekend and, and then left the country in a, in a, in a bad situation. Um, but just by the way, as, a, as, a, as an interesting fact, uh, when Evo Morales was first elected mm-hmm. uh, as the president of, of Bolivia, we invited him to come to South Africa. And yes. we hosted him here in South Africa on a private basis. Um, for us, it was important because he was the first elected indigenous leader right. in Latin America. Yeah, quite a big deal. Big deal. Yeah. And we wanted to expose him to the South African experience, with, with, which we did. And he came here had a good week of uh, exposure to the South African leadership and and the South African experience. He went back, I think, well influenced. But the problem is he wanted to stay too long. <laughs> and that yeah. is why he got kicked, but kicked out. But this is a constant problem in politics. Exactly. I'm curious also about the things that you've done since then because you have received a number of awards. You've obviously been chairman of the Civil Society Initiative, something which I remember was was very dear to Bill Clinton and to Nelson Mandela. Exactly. Um, and and all of these things, out of 
everything, what are you most proud of? What gives you joy? And, and you're not allowed to say your children or your or your your own personal sense of satisfaction that you know, a life you've built, but for for the achievement list, what's your what's your thing that gives you the most happiness? I, I to be very frank about it, I think what I'm doing now, right now. Really? Absolutely. You're not just saying that because now what you're doing is what you're currently busy with. No, I, focus. I, I'm, I'm saying that because I'm at the age of 72, as busy as I've ever been in my life. <laughs> uh, I'm more busy now than probably 10 years ago. I feel I'm, I'm, I'm making a contribution that is worthwhile for the country. I, I, it's, it's, it's extremely rewarding what I'm doing. And, and, and if I have to put myself back 20 years ago when I left politics, I would nov- never have envisaged that I would be at this stage, 20 years later, be as active as I am and getting so much fulfillment. And that is why I'm saying I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. And I, I say this because I had the same question that you put to me recently, and I had to think about it. So mm. it's, it's something that I worked through in my mind. Well, it's not that I don't believe you. And, and, <laughs> and it's, uh, I'm saying yeah. it, you know, because it's that in itself, I think it's aspirational. Yes. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this also because I think I can make a difference even where we are right now for the longer term. Well, I can tell you only from the point of view of an observer on the outside, someone who's, who's just grateful to live in the country that we live in, despite all of our challenges and problems. And I said the same thing to a number of people, not a huge number of people, because there's some of them I'm not that grateful to, but I do think it's worth remarking on. And, and you know, a little bit of, of gratitude is probably the very least we can do in the case of a life like yours, which has been a life of service. So thank you for everything you've done for this country. And thank you for helping to shepherd us into a, an age where I think we seldom appreciate the the, the the massive importance of things like individual rights, which you've helped to cultivate a, a respect for. Thank you for everything you've done. It's kind of you to say that. Thank you, Gareth. I, I appreciate it. But right. can I return the same <laughs> and say How? thank you for, for what you're doing oh. to keep the debate and the discussion alive. The one thing that we learned, after all, during our time of difficulties and and negotiations, finding answers and what, was the value of dialogue. And in a certain way, you are leading in your own way a dialogue in South Africa, among South well, Africans, and that's fantastic. If it's in some way helpful, then that's very kind of you. But uh, thank you very much for coming to spend time with us today. Thank you.